Remember, for evolution to be true, evolutionary scientists have to convince you that the Earth is billions of years old. They say that evolution can be true because time plus chance means anything is possible, so they need enough time to go by. They need to convince you the Earth is four and a half billion years old and that through millions and billions of years of evolution, this could be true. Well, when you look at the actual scientific evidence, you see that the Earth cannot be billions of years old. We've just been conditioned to think that it must be. You know, I remember one day back in 2004, I was on my way to a speaking engagement when I stopped into a Detroit-area science store just to browse, and I noticed a fossilized bone sitting on the shelf for sale. The sign said it was 50 million years old, so I asked the clerk how she knew it was 50 million years old. She said, let me go get the owner. He's a retired scientist. I said, okay. So the owner came out, and I politely asked him how he knew the bone was 50 million years old. He said it had been dated to be that old. I reminded him that you can't radiometrically date organic material to an age in the millions, and he said, well, okay, yeah, that's true. It's dated according to the age of the rocks it was found in. Now, I thought about bringing up the fact that evolutionary scientists also happen to date the rocks according to how old the fossils are that are found in them, but I didn't have time to get into that debate. Later in this CD, though, you will learn about circular reasoning and how that's used to actually date the rocks and the fossils by using the so-called dates of each other to date each other. But anyway, back to my scientist friend. I asked him, how do I know that bone isn't just a couple of hundred years old? I remember he laughed and he said, that's impossible. And I said, why? And he said, because it's fossilized, it can't be just a couple of hundred years old. So I then asked him if he was aware of the fact that creation scientists and creation museums have in their possessions right now fossilized items such as hats, food, sausage links, hams, bags of flour, even a foot in a cowboy boot, completely fossilized, solid stone. He said, yeah, I've heard of those, but they're not really fossils. So I said, of course, why not? And he said, because those modern items are clearly modern items that aren't old enough to be fossils since it takes a long time for things to fossilize. So then I asked him, okay, so if this bone on your shelf turned to stone and that hat that I mentioned has also turned to stone, they both possess the very same physical properties, right? He reluctantly said, well, yes. So then I said, if their physical properties are identical in that they both have permineralized into stone, you say the reason the hat is not a fossil is because it's not as old as the bone? I mean, is that really your argument? And I remember he looked at me for a few seconds of silence and then said, well, when you put it like that, it makes my argument sound silly. I said back to him, hey, look, you're the scientist. I'm just the customer. At which time I thanked him for his time. I shook his hand and I went on my way to my speaking engagement. The point is that we've all been conditioned to believe that certain things must be millions of years old. Another example of this brainwashing is the geologic column. We've all seen these impressive layers of ground as we drive on a road that's been cut through a mountain, or when we look at the walls of the Grand Canyon. We also see this geologic column on paper in our geology books. Now here's a dirty little secret that the evolutionary scientists don't want you to know. Did you know that the geologic column in your school textbook doesn't line up with the actual geologic strata in the ground? That's right. Over 99% of all of the layers in the actual ground are different and in different sequence than the official geologic column you see in your geology book. Bottom line, it appears that way on paper, but it doesn't appear that way in the ground. The layers in the ground are actually all out of sequence. They're upside down, inverted, missing layers. The layers are all randomly shuffled throughout the entire planet, kind of like you shuffle a deck of cards. This is exactly what we would expect to see if there were, say, a worldwide flood producing massive mudslides all over the Earth. However, it is not what we should see if these layers supposedly represent the surfaces of the Earth over the last 500 million years. Simply put, the creation scientist says the geologic strata that we see in the ground 
was laid down at about the same time or in a fairly short period of time as part of the natural layering that takes place after massive flooding and mudslides, or in other words, after Noah's flood, which would have been about 4,500 years ago, according to a biblical timeline. Evolutionary scientists, however, say the layers in the ground were the various surfaces of the earth over the last 500 million years. Now remember, they need that to be true because they need hundreds of millions of years for Darwin's theory of evolution. So let's examine the evidence and see which theory makes sense. In the ground right now are literally thousands of what's called polystrate fossils. Now these are fossils that are standing upright vertically punching through many layers of strata. You know, many poly layers of strata. That's where you get polystrate fossil or polystrata fossil in the ground right now. In other words, picture a fossilized tree standing upright, right in the middle, smack in the middle of the geologic column, going up through millions of supposed years of several layers. Now, if the evolutionists are right, that would mean the bottom of the tree would be in layers of the ground that's millions of years older than the top of the tree. I mean, how logical is that? There are literally thousands of these polystrate trees fossilized right now in the ground all over the earth. Dirty little secret. Evolutionary scientists don't like talking about this. Creation scientists love talking about polystrate fossils. I can assure you, you're never going to see these photos in your school geology book because the evolutionists don't want you to know about them. What's also interesting is that the majority of these fossilized trees don't have branches or roots. They literally look like telephone poles. So how did you get thousands of what look like telephone poles standing upright, punching through several layers of supposed geologic strata representing supposedly millions and millions of years? How did they get there? Well, listen to this. In 1980, when Mount St. Helens erupted, we noticed a fascinating phenomenon. The force of the eruption blasted the forests in the area with such power that it broke the trees off at the base of the ground, leaving the roots underground, and it stripped the branches from the tree trunks themselves, leaving the hillsides littered with thousands of, guess what, what appeared to be telephone poles. No branches, no roots. We see that this is actually common when volcanoes erupt near forests and leave thousands of branchless, rootless trees littering the hillsides. Near Mount St. Helens, thousands of these what appear to be telephone pole trees rolled into a nearby Spirit Lake, creating massive log mats. Now, again, this was observed. We saw this back in the 1980s. To see the photos, it looks like thousands of telephone poles just floating in the water. Anyway, as the trees became waterlogged, they eventually sank, but they didn't sink horizontally. What was noticed is that as they got more waterlogged, they eventually turned upright, floating vertically in the water, until finally they slowly sank down through the surface of the water, all the way down to the bottom, punching their way into the muddy bottom. Additional mudslides into the lake ended up covering them up even more. This isn't a theory. This is what was actually observed in the 1980s. So now, let's go back to Noah's flood. If there were a worldwide flood and waters were springing forth from the deep, as the Bible says, there would have been massive continental shifting. We know today that continental shifting triggers volcanoes, so it's safe to assume that if the story of Noah's flood is true, there would have also been volcanoes erupting all over the earth. That means, guess what, there would have been many forests laid bare, its trees stripped of its roots and branches, and floating log mats worldwide of branchless, rootless trees, just like we saw from Mount St. Helens in 1980. And remember, we can now observe that this is what happens when volcanoes erupt. It's not guesswork. These trees back then at Noah's flood would have done exactly the same thing they did today, or at least in the 1980s. They would have gotten waterlogged, turned vertical in the flood waters, and eventually sank that way, punching down through the mud and then being covered up by additional layering naturally that happens when mudslides take place. All over the earth today are literally thousands of rootless, branchless, fossilized trees standing upright, punching right through several layers of the geologic strata that's supposed to be, according to the evolutionists, representing hundreds of millions of years 
of layering. 